Hi everyone, it's Octavia, they them pronouns please. Before we begin, I just want to say this is a supplement video. I do a podcast with my good friend the weasel called Comic Book Club, which is exactly as it sounds. We read a comic book and then we talk about it in depth. The next episode is Overture from the Sandman series by Neil Gaiman. Now, for the most part, it is a self-contained prequel story, but I did want to do a short review for the main series as well. And when the podcast episode comes out, I will leave a link to it in the description. Anyway, you read the title of the video. This is a summary and analysis of the Sandman series. This will include the original 10 volume set as well as a few extra volumes. Dream Hunters, Endless Nights, and Briefly Overture. As I said, we're going to do a whole podcast talking about it, so I don't want to say too much here, but I will briefly mention it. I am aware there are several spin-off series and books featuring these characters, but aside from the ones I've mentioned here, I have not read them, and I honestly doubt I will. So without further ado, here we go. The premise. This is Dream. He has a lot of other names, but Dream works just fine. He is the physical embodiment and personification of Dreams. He has six other siblings, Destiny, Death, Desire, Despair, Destruction, and Delirium, all of which are likewise personifications of their namesakes. They pop in from time to time, but for the most part this is about Dream and his adventures. Y well, sort of. Each volume is more or less a self-contained story, and about half of them are actually about the main character and what I hesitately call the main stories, and then the other half are essentially just stories about whatever Neil Gaiman had on his mind at the time, and Dream is put in at the last second so he can justify it to his publishers. Honestly, part of me seriously wonders why he didn't get fired for doing this. These stories have next to nothing to do with Dream, and they honestly feel much more like Neil Gaiman was writing fanfiction for his own series. Uh, but moving on. The first five volumes are horror adventure, but then somewhere in volume six it kind of changes more to tragedy drama. This is also an R-rated series, and... There is a lot of graphic and disturbing content. If you're not into that, or if you're a kid, then this really isn't for you. Also, it probably goes without saying, but there will be spoilers in this video. I'm gonna try and keep them to a minimum, but I'm gonna have to talk about very specific plot points in order to actually properly talk about the whole thing. Now that I've finally gotten the setup all the way, let's continue. Volume 1, Preludes and Nocturnes. Dream gets captured by a cult. They were trying to capture Death so that they could bribe her into giving them powers, but they failed and got Dream instead. After being imprisoned by them for 70 years, Dream breaks free and goes on a fetch quest to regain his tools that were taken from him by the cult. This is a very solid story, and it's also a very straightforward story. Because it's a straightforward story, we get a lot of time focused on Dream and what he's going through. Dream is a pretty stone-faced character, but through his narration you really get to feel everything he's going through and really connect with him. And honestly, that's all you need for a good story. If you can make your audience care about your characters, you're pretty much set. All you have to do after that is make sure you don't do anything offensive or stupid. Here, I really only have three criticisms. The first is that the first issue is... Well, really, really boring, and you know how I said we get to spend a lot of time with Dream? Well, that's true for every issue except for this one. This one is essentially just a huge exposition dump, and most of it doesn't even come back. Some of it does, but most of it doesn't. And in all honesty, we're adults. The stuff that does come back really didn't need to be established in the first place. I mean, we don't really establish an emotional connection to any of these characters. That, and it's also kind of insulting that we spend more time with the abuser rather than the victim, because that kind of implies that the abuser is more interesting and more worthy of our time, and... Yeah, hopefully I don't have to explain that any further. Hmm. The only real reason I can see why Neil Gaiman would do this is to sort of demonstrate the effect his absence has on the world, but really that doesn't extend much beyond this first issue. 
the times where it does come back at to matter, it's very specific events, and they're honestly very few. I would say maybe three events. Now, the second is that a lot of this is overly graphic. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be a Christian mom, and I do understand that things like gore, violence, and nudity have their place, such as at one point we literally go to hell, and it's really gross and really graphic, but that makes sense, it's hell. When Dream is being held captive, he's completely naked. This is good, it represents how vulnerable he is, and it lines up with his situation since his captors don't really see him as a person and thus demoralize him. However, then there's the story 24 hours, and it's literally just the villain torturing people for an entire issue. It's, it's just torture porn. You can skip it and lose literally nothing. The only thing you can argue it does is establish the villain as an insane, dangerous person, but I would argue that was already accomplished in the last issue when he killed an innocent woman. Honestly, I was kind of just bored during this issue and making snide remarks. And the last problem is death. And when I say this, I mean death as a character. E boy. In earlier drafts of this script, I went on whole rants about her, so I'm gonna try and keep this as short as I can. In the last story, The Sound of Her Wings, this is about Death coming to quote-unquote cheer up her little brother, and the following conversation takes place. You see, until then I had been driven. I'd had a true quest, a purpose beyond my function, and then... Suddenly, the quest was over. I felt drained, disappointed, let down. Does that make sense? I had been sure that as soon as I had everything back, I'd feel good. But inside, I felt worse than when I started. I feel like nothing. There. You asked. I'm sorry. Maybe I don't have an answer. Have you finished? Yes. Could have called me, you know. I didn't want to worry you. I don't believe it. Let me tell you something, Dream, and I'm only going to say this once, so you better pay attention. You are utterly the stupidest, most self-centered, appallingest excuse for an anthropomorphic personification on this or any other plane. An infantile, adolescent, pathetic specimen. Feeling all sorry for yourself because your little game is over and you haven't got the... the balls to go and find a new one? You threw the bread at me. I don't believe this. Dream, you're as bad as... as... as desire. Or worse. Did it occur to you that I'd be worried silly about you? I didn't think. That's exactly it! You didn't think! You lummox, you overgrown, bubble-headed... Oh! oh! Give me strength. Anyone with an ounce of intelligence can tell you this is a textbook case of gaslighting and emotional abuse. He is in pain, and for good reason. He was tortured for 70 years. And she basically just says man up and go back to work. Just to be clear, things like this happen pretty much every time that these two characters interact. She is continually belittling him and dismissing any concerns he has. She continuously tells him to ask for help if he needs it, but when he does, she never gives it to him. This is an abusive relationship, and it is being portrayed as healthy and normal. This is very, very bad. Hopefully I do not need to go on further to explain why. I think what bothers me the most is that no one, either in the audience or the author, seems to actually realize. Anyways, overall, this is a really good book worth your money. If what I'm describing sounds like something you'll enjoy, you'll almost certainly enjoy it. Volume 2, The Doll's House. Yeah, this is atrocious. You don't notice it the first time around, but rereading it after finishing the series, it's easily the worst comic in the entire series, and easily one of the worst comics, period, I can ever remember reading. The first time reading it, there are only two main problems. Number one being it prioritizes the plot over the characters. 
There is so much going on in this volume that it just wouldn't be practical for me to summarize it in this video. I never had any trouble keeping up with what was going on, but because of how busy it is, we don't really get to spend enough time to actually connect with any of the new characters. And since I didn't care about the characters, I really didn't care about anything else that was going on. Second, this isn't even really about Dream, it's about a new character, Rose. The entire reason I'm buying this book is to read about Dream going on adventures, so when Dream is basically a plot device in his own series, I feel cheated. Rose isn't even really much of a character, she has very little agency and spends more time talking about other people than herself. I didn't really feel like I started to care about her until the very end when she's kind of writing this diary entry reflecting on everything that was happening. That I liked! Then the book ended immediately after that, so uh, who really cares? Okay, so those problems are bad, but they're not too bad, so what makes this book so horribly when you reread it? Dream is out of character. Dream is an insufferable ass in this book. You don't notice it the first time around because you could easily say he's acting differently because now the circumstances have changed, he's got all his power back. Or you could say he's acting differently because at some points it takes place in the very distant past and of course he would act differently then. E but no. In later volumes, he just doesn't act like this regardless of the time or circumstances. He is respectful, and the most you can really accuse him of is being impatient and insensitive. Those are good flaws for a character and fit so much better with Dream, but here those flaws are grossly exaggerated till he's basically unrecognizable. And yes, I am fully aware of how that sounds. Oftentimes, when people see a character they really like doing something terrible or despicable, they dismiss it as out of character merely so they can preserve the image of that character in their head and not feel any guilt about admiring them. However, here I think I'm fully justified in saying that this is out of character. In this book, Dream carries out an incredibly toxic romance with a character called Nada. She is a 16-year-old girl, a queen of an African city-state, and to make a short story even shorter, basically, basically, he abuses and has sex with her, and then when she rejects him, he literally has her imprisoned in hell. Let's very quickly compare that to all of his other romantic relationships. In his very first romance, his partner cheated on him and when he caught her doing this, he did not even get angry at her, he simply walked away. In his second romance, essentially they were both forced into the relationship. Now we don't really get to see any of this relationship so I couldn't tell you if it was toxic or healthy, but when his lover wants to leave him, he literally creates an entire world for her, then gives her a magical gemstone, which is essentially a piece of his soul, so that the world he created for her can be powered and exist when he's not around. In his third romance, the reason they split up is because number one, they both wanted different things from it, and number two, and to make a very long story short, essentially his kid makes a horrible decision which ends in tragedy, and Dream is blamed for allowing this to happen, even though he's the only one in that situation who actually gave his son good advice. And that's when they finally cut off the relationship for good. In his last romance, we see literally none of it on screen, in fact we don't even know who he's dating until the relationship has already ended, however both Dream and his ex give the same account that essentially she realized that she wasn't in love with him, she was in love with his power, and wasn't really getting anything out of the relationship, so she left. Now, when we compare those four relationships to this one, I think it's pretty safe to say he's out of character. The only real way to explain this in-universe is to say that the only reason he acted the way he did was because his sibling Desire used their powers to essentially brainwash him into doing it. That is plausible since it is shown in the next issue that Desire did know about it and had something to do with it, but we're never told what they did so it's not really much to go on. 
Honestly, this whole volume is trash and it will come back to haunt us. I hate it. The only real good thing to come out of this is Matthew. Matthew was a human man who died in his sleep and now he's a raven who helps dream out with things. He's the sweetest thing ever and I love him. Volume 3, Dream Country. This is filler. The first two are short horror stories and they're alright. I honestly don't have anything to say about them one way or another. The third story is the same, but it got an award, so I'm obligated to talk about it. A Midsummer's Night Dream. Shakespeare and co. performed the play of the same name for Dream and a bunch of fairy folk. Whether or not you like this depends on whether or not you like Shakespeare. If you like Shakespeare, you'll enjoy this story just fine, but if you're like me, you'll just be bored. The last story is Facade, and it's bad because it portrays suicide as a good thing. A woman gets superpowers that make her deformed, and instead of and instead of getting therapy and or learning how to utilize her powers to her benefit, she kills herself. Hopefully I don't need to explain why this is bad. This is also another instance of Death being a terrible person. She meets a distraught woman, and after a few minutes of conversation that don't even properly address why she's upset, she just decides to help her commit suicide. Yep, Death is a bitch. She's one of those people who needs to be seen as a good person by those around her and will do anything to keep that image up, even at the cost of the well-being to those around her. I think the thing I hate about this the most is that the woman, whose name is Element Girl, has shape-shifting powers, and although she can't shape-shift into just looking like a normal human, she can shape-shift into literally any other substance, and from what I understand, she can turn anything into anything else, and even summon objects. She keeps making masks for herself out of silicon, but that begs the question of why doesn't she just turn her actual body into silicon? Like, why does she make herself a mask? That doesn't make sense. And don't tell me like it's some metaphor, because the metaphor could still work if she was just changing her normal body. And heck, even if that didn't work, why didn't she just change herself into, like, diamond or gold or something attractive? There are a lot of very easy solutions to this. To sum it up, I don't like this volume. It's filler, and I recommend you just skip it. Volume 4, Seasons of Mist. Alright, now we're back to what we actually paid for. This is a really good one. Lucifer decides to retire, so Lucifer, the actual devil, decides to retire, and he gives hell to Dream. A bunch of people show up to try and convince Dream to give it to them, because apparently hell has a very high retail value. This is just a really fun story, and it's good for all the same reasons the first one is. It's about Dream, which is what I paid for, it prioritizes the characters over the plot, and we get to see Dream and Matthew being cute together. The bulk of it is really just watching Dream agonize over this decision and try and put up with his uninvited guests, who are honestly pretty shitty. The only thing that drags it down is Nada. I, I want to say I like her enough as a character, but really she barely has a character. She's really just a plot device more than anything else. In Volume 1, she's just a cameo. In Volume 2, we get her backstory, but it's really too short to really connect with. And the only thing we see is her go after a man whom she doesn't even know the name of. She's just going after him because he looks hot. I'm not saying she deserves what she got, I'm, that is definitely not what I'm saying. I'm just saying the only thing we really know about her is that she's an abuse victim and she apparently really wanted to screw this one guy. That's not enough to endear us to her. In this volume, she really only serves as something to trigger Lucifer into giving up hell and then literally becoming a bargaining chip for the demons. But Lucifer doesn't need a trigger, he can just be having a midlife crisis, that happens all the time. And the demons already have a legitimate claim to hell, as well as another bargaining chip, so she really has no purpose being in this story at all. It makes no sense. Nada's story is something that either needed to be heavily expanded upon, or completely removed. I feel like we should have just used one of those one-shot issues to sort of write it off. The reason I say I don't like Nada being here is just because 
She comes from a story that is already really bad, and so she drags all that emotional baggage with her. I like this story, but she reminds me of a terrible story, and that kind of sours it for me. Overall, this is a really good volume. It doesn't have any real glaring issues, and it's certainly worth your money. Volume 5, A Game of You. This is honestly more filler, except for instead of a bunch of short stories, it's one long story. And it has absolutely nothing to do with anything and never comes back in any meaningful way. It's an okay story by itself, but it has a really weird ending. I'm not sure what the message of this story is or its reason for existing. I know someone's probably already typing a furious comment about how I'm just too stupid to understand the true beauty and meaning of this story, but honestly, I don't care. I don't care about this story. I don't care enough to analyze it any further. Yes, if I really thought about it, I could probably come up with a few things, but I just don't care. The story is honestly just really boring. It feels like I'm reading one of those Wizard of Oz books, but written by an edgelord with self-hatred issues. I... <sighs> Like, I, I, I don't care. And again, this isn't about Dream. I specifically paid to see Dream. The most noteworthy thing about this book is that it has a transgender woman in it, Wanda, and a lesbian couple, that being Foxglove and Hazel. However, Wanda dies at the end, along with the only black character in the story. And Hazel cheats on Foxglove, and we know Foxglove's previous relationship was also abusive. Honestly, I want to say I feel bad for her, but I really don't. We don't know enough about her. This series has a continuing problem where it expects you to care about things merely because of what they are. It expects you to care about romance because it's romance. It expects you to care about a character's suffering merely because they're suffering. But oftentimes it really just skips the work it needs to do. I'm aware that what I'm reading is fiction. I'm aware these people aren't real. If you want me to care about what's going on, you need to make it feel like it's real and like I'm looking at real people, but I don't know anything about Foxglove. We barely know anything about Hazel. That's not to say they're poorly written. The main problem here is just time. They're not given enough time to really be fleshed out. As well as the fact that I'm already grumpy about the fact that I'm not getting what I paid for. Now, I will say I don't think this is bigotry. This is a problem that pursues through most, if not all, of Neil Gaiman's books in one way or another, whether or not there's any LGBT representation. For instance, his novel Stardust is a fantasy romance where the titular couple spends most of the novel fighting, and then, when they start to get along, he skips over all of their bonding and goes pretty much straight to the end. Innocent characters getting horribly punished is also a reoccurring problem, both in this series and other books. I'll talk about it more later, but basically what I'm saying is here is the problems we see here with the LGBT representation show up throughout this whole thing, but we notice it more when it's happening to them. In the end... This volume is pure filler, and more than anything, I was bored. If you want to read it, go ahead, I guess. I can't stop you, but I can't recommend it. Volume 6, Fables and Reflections. This is more filler, but actually I kind of like this volume. Maybe it's because at this point I was used to being screwed out of my money and just kind of allowed myself to enjoy it, but it's alright. Let me make this clear, I don't hate filler for being filler. I hate filler because I want to read about Dream, and most of the filler has nothing to do with him. It's like going to a candy store and finding out they don't sell chocolate. Here, we do have stories like that, but we also have a few good stories too. The Hunt had nothing really to do with Dream, but it did make me laugh. I don't know if it was supposed to make me laugh, but it did, and I'll appreciate that. A Parliament of Rooks was about the secondary characters swapping stories, and they were alright. It had a lot of Matthew in it, and I will always appreciate more Matthew. 
We just need more of Matthew being a good birdie boyfriend to dream. We just need more of that. We also got a story that does have something to do with the rest of the story. I know, who knew? Remember how earlier I said that Dream's son did something stupid and that's why he broke up with his current partner? Well, that's pretty much this story, the Song of Orpheus. Even though it has nothing to do with Dream, it still does have a place in the narrative. Now, technically you could skip volume 6, it doesn't contribute to the plot and you're an adult, you would be able to figure out what's going on for yourself. However, it does give more emotional weight to later events. You can skip it if you want, it's one of those books where I don't regret buying or reading it, but if I lost it, I don't think I would go out and buy a replacement. Volume 7, Brief Lives. This is easily one of the best comics I've ever read, both in the series and just in general. Dream's little sister, Delirium, misses their long-lost brother, Destruction, so the two of them go off on a quest to find him. And that's pretty much it. It has all the things you want, and it's just one of the sweetest things ever. Child characters are often really hard to get right because usually they end up too annoying or unrealistically sweet. Delirium strikes a nice balance between the two. I don't want to repeat myself too much by giving it the same praise I did for Volume 1 and Volume 4, or ruin it with spoilers, so I'll leave it at that. It's really good. Go and read it. I only have one major problem, and that's Delirium's character design. Throughout the comic, she's dressed in really revealing and sometimes provocative clothing. Sometimes it just makes her look homeless and ratty, but other times it just looks like straight up lingerie. And this character is a child. She is described, drawn, and behaves like a child. Before any of you go and tell me that she's technically thousands of years old, I will remind you that in Volume 4, Episode 0, they specifically say the Endless don't measure time the same way we do. They call her a child, she is a child, and some of these images honestly just kind of look like downright child pornography. I don't really have anything else to say. And from what I can remember and from what I checked, they do fix this problem in later volumes, so I think they already realized and addressed it. Huh, I think I should have started off with the bad stuff so I could end on something positive. Anyway, aside from that, it's really just a really good book, it's super sweet, it's super fun, and you're honestly just gonna have a nice time reading it. I would say if you only read one book from this series, read that one, you're gonna have fun. Honestly, I wish the entire series could have been just about dream bonding with people in stories like this, but it's not. Volume 8, The World's End. This is more filler and I'm back to hating it. This whole thing is literally just a bunch of random people trading stories in a tavern. Which basically has I don't want to work today written all over it. Just, just skip it. <laughs> just spend, just skip it and spend your money elsewhere. Volume 9, The Kindly Ones. This is essentially the finale of the show and wraps everything up. And I hate it. So, a long time ago, Death made Dream's son, Orpheus, immortal, so he could go on a quest to the Underworld and come back. As we all know from the myth, he fails and ends up as nothing but a head. Kinda like in Futurama. In the modern day, Dream euthanizes him according to his wishes. Now, apparently there are laws against doing this, so the three fates go on a killing spree through his realm, ending with Dream's death and a semi-reincarnation of him. I say semi because it's mostly this kid, Daniel, absorbing Dream's powers and sort of becoming him, but he does seem to absorb some of the old Dream as well. It's a little unclear, all of the characters talk about him as if he's an entirely different person, but from what little we see of him, he just kind of feels like a more innocent version of Dream. It just kind of feels like we hit Dream with an amnesia ray or something like that, and yeah, it's unclear and honestly I don't care enough to analyze it anymore. I hate this for a lot of reasons. Most of them I've already talked about, like how Dream essentially becomes a background character in his own story. 
how we keep jumping from character to character, and the plot's really convoluted. But like I've said, I've already talked about those things and why they're problems. Here, we're finally going to talk about the biggest reoccurring problem throughout the entire series. The way it handles Dream's abuse. Dream is easily the most abused character in the entire series, and it's not handled well at all. A lot of the times, it's not even acknowledged that there is abuse going on, such as his relationship with Death, which I mentioned earlier. I said in Volume 1 she shames and gaslights him. Here, when he's about to die, she lectures him about responsibility, even though none of this could have happened had she not made his kid immortal in the first place. And when she was doing that, she knew full well it was wrong, it was against the rules, and it could very easily end tragically, which it did. I also hate that in that story, Dream is essentially blamed for everything that happened because he himself didn't bring Euricity back from the dead. But at the same time, the ending of the story essentially validates him. His whole hang-up on that was that you should just grieve and let things die naturally, and that if you interfered with it, it could end tragically. Which is exactly what happens. Back to the present, when he tells her he's made preparations for his death, she says this, You've been making them for ages, you just didn't let yourself know that was what you were doing. Which implies that she knew Dream was suffering from suicidal ideations for a long time and actively chose to do nothing about it. Either that or she's lying to try and make herself seem smarter, both of which are incredibly despicable. In the next volume, all of the characters just accept that Dream's death was the result of his own actions and choices, but this completely ignores the ridiculous amount of things that happened in order for him to actually die, most of which were completely out of his control. In the entire thing, there are only two choices he makes that directly lead to his death. The first was to euthanize his son, and the second was to sacrifice himself to the Furies. In both of those cases, they really weren't fair decisions to make. The first decision was forced upon him by the fact that his son was made immortal, and the choices he had was either euthanize him or let him suffer, which is a horrible choice and completely unfair, and the second decision was essentially either he has to leave his home and everything he knows and loves, or he has to sacrifice himself. Again, that's a very unfair decision, and in both instances, his options are pretty terrible no matter what he does. A couple of the characters seem to think it's a suicide. Let's cross that off the list right now. The only way it could be a suicide is if Dream was the one who organized Daniel's kidnapping, and we know he didn't do that because the all-knowing fates say, even if he had killed your son, we could do nothing about it. Also, Dream organizing the kidnapping and killing of an innocent baby would be completely out of character. Dream is always against killing. He hates it. He only does it when it's absolutely necessary. I hate this volume. I hate it so much. Please do not spend your money on this. The summary I've given here should give you enough information to understand the next volume. Just please don't buy this. Volume 10, The Wake. Now this is basically an epilogue to the series, but for the most part it's actually really good. I'm glad we got to end on something relatively nice. The first few issues are Dream's funeral and the new Dream adjusting to his role. This part I like. For the most part, it's just the other characters talking about what Dream meant to them and grieving together, which is honestly really sweet. Though, I will say, Matthew and Delirium are the only ones who feel like they have a realistic reaction to what's going on. Most of the other characters just kind of accept it with a, Oh yeah, I guess that happened. The only thing I really hate about this section is what I said earlier in Volume 9, and that's about how it handles Dream's abuse. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to repeat myself too much, I talked about it enough in Volume 9, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more in the conclusion, so for now let's move on. The rest of the volume is just more short stories, and honestly I don't like them. They're not bad, but they wrap up loose ends that really don't need to be addressed. They just feel redundant, 
and I feel like it would have been a lot more powerful if we just ended it with that page of the new dream meeting his family. That being said, this one is worth your money, and I do recommend it. Alright, now we've finished up with the main series, now we're going to do with the single volume installments. These are things that were, from what I understand, mostly just stories that were released as celebrations of the anniversaries this had, or just, you know, fun little attachments. The first of this is Dream Hunters. This is a fairy tale in ancient Japan. A fox spirit, I want to say a kitsune, but they never use that word, so fox spirit it is, falls in love with a monk, and some noble wants to sacrifice the monk as a part of a spell. By romance standards, this is really good. By regular story standards, this is mediocre. The whole plot revolves around the idea that these two are in love, but they're not really in love. As I said, Neil Gaiman is shit at writing romance. They only have one real conversation with each other in which the fox tried to cheat him out of his house. This is at best a crush or infatuation. Honestly, it would have just made a lot more sense if the fox felt honor bound to help him to make up for causing him trouble and then the monk felt obligated to return the favor. If a fairy tale in Japan sounds cool, you'll probably like it just fine, but that's really all it has going for it. Endless Nights. This is seven short stories about the Endless. Well, not really. That's what the book jacket says, but really it's more about seven people who meet them. And... I mean... It's nice enough. I like Dream Story. This is about Dream's first lover, and I already summarized it earlier. Dream's lover cheats on him, and yada yada. Uh, it's probably my favorite story because it deals with my favorite character, but it's just a sad short story and that's really all there is to it. I like it enough, but who cares. Death Story just kind of feels like a retelling of the Red Death. I hate Death as a character, so I'm already inclined to hate a story about her. Delirium Story is unique, and I can appreciate that, but it's less a story and it feels much more like a poem about experiencing delirium. I can enjoy that for what it is, but it's an inquired taste. Despair's section is pretty much the same, but about despair instead of delirium. As far as the rest go, I don't have anything to say one way or another. They're stories. They exist. I didn't notice anything particularly offensive. I didn't notice anything particularly good. If I try to go more detailed into it, I'm just gonna hate writing this. Finally, Overture. I'm not gonna talk about this too much, because as I said, we're gonna do a podcast about it. But this is definitely worth mentioning. This has everything I paid for and wanted to see in a Sandman story. Basically, it's about Dream going on a quest to save the universe. I think if push comes to shove, I would say that this is the highest quality of the Sandman stories, and probably my favorite. This is mostly because it seems to be the only volume that's fully aware of the fact that Dream is an abuse victim and not a bad person. From what I can tell, this actually understands the toxicity surrounding him and why he is the way he is. We still don't really acknowledge Death as an abuser, but she's really just a cameo in here, so I'm not gonna get mad at that. Though, knowing Neil Gaiman and what kind of author he is, this could simply be a happy accident or this could be intentional. Honestly, you can never tell with him. It doesn't correct previous installments, but it handles things properly here. But it handles things a lot more properly here, and when they slip up, it's at the very least a lot more graceful. I do wish it had been a little bit blunter about this stuff that's going on, and we'd actually see his abusers get their comeuppance, but honestly at this point, I, I'll just take what I can get. Overall, this is the most competently written and probably the most enjoyable. I know I said if you buy any one comic, buy volume 7, but I think I might have to take that back. Honestly, they're just both really good. Final thoughts. So, this is a weird one. Everyone lords this as some masterpiece that changed the comic industry and blah 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 blah. However, when I actually hear about the changes or the firsts that this comic did, like the first to win an award that I'm too lazy to look up, the first series to end when the original author left, or the first to be sold in a volume, 
those are all nice, but they don't really affect the quality of the story, and they don't affect the quality of the stories that come after it. It really just changes how they're published, which is nice, but, uh, who cares? Neil Gaiman has gone on the record multiple times saying that this series is supposed to be about Dream learning that he needs to change or die and coming to that choice. However, this is completely stupid. Number one, throughout the entire series, change and death are both treated as inevitabilities. Lots of characters point out that Dream has changed, and Dream is always surprised when they make this observation. The entire story with Orpheus that precedes Dream's death is pretty much about how death is inevitable, so I don't know where this sudden choice between either or has come up from. As I said earlier, Dream only has two choices that directly lead to his death, and they're both incredibly unfair. More than any, however, more than anything, the idea that Dream needs to change or die is blaming the victim. As I said, there are only two choices Dream made that directly led to his death, and they were both incredibly unfair, and they were forced upon him by the actions of other people. And in broader terms of what goes on throughout this entire story, Dream is easily the most morally sound and well-adjusted character probably of the entire cast, and definitely of all of the Endless. He is the only character we actively see strive for self-improvement. Every time we hear about him doing something terrible, it is eventually followed up with a story about him trying to correct that terrible thing he did. And he does that merely because it's the right thing to do. There really isn't anyone powerful enough to make him do the right thing if he chooses not to. And honestly, half the time there wouldn't even really be a witness to him doing that terrible thing. He tells people what he did, they call him out for it, and he says, Okay, I guess I'll go fix that. He's the only character we see actively doing that. Other characters change, yes, but that's usually because their environment forces them to. Other characters don't do terrible things and are already morally sound, but we don't really get to see the process to that. The only real change Dream needs to make in his life is he needs to cut out all these toxic people who treat him like shit. But it's very obvious to anyone with a brain that Dream has essentially flatlined into that state where he either does not recognize he's being abused because of how long it's been going on, or he genuinely believes he deserves the abuse. There are a lot of moments where he rather just dismisses his own unhappiness or his own turmoil as insignificant, such as in Overture, he tells his mother that he doesn't expect anything and he's usually right, and he shows no anger at this. In Volume 9, Odin says he's disappointed in him, and Dream just kind of like, oh. And again, every time Death shows up, she's constantly insulting him. Saying that Dream is the one who needs to change in this situation is just flat out victim blaming. No, he is not the one responsible for anything going on here. He needs help. He needs his birdie boyfriend to step in and tell people off. Saying Dream is the one who needs to change or die is essentially saying that it's Dream's fault for letting people abuse him rather than saying it's their fault for being assholes in the first place. Now, finally, all of that being said, I do understand why people like it. And in all honesty, I do consider myself a fan. Dream is probably my new favorite character of all time. Despite how unjust his ending is, and despite how disgusted I am by the fact his abusers never face punishment for it, he's just a really inspiring character. If you asked me what the series was about, I would say that it was about Dream trying his best to be a good person, despite all of the abuse he suffered, and despite the fact that he has a job that requires him to do terrible things. If you can get past the problems I've mentioned, you're gonna love the rest. It definitely says a lot that I spent over $200 just because I wanted to see more of Dream and Matthew. That's how much I fell in love with him. That's the main sell of this. 
the characters that actually are characters are some of the best you'll ever see, regardless of medium. So, should you read it? Eh, in the end, I would say you should definitely read volumes 1, 4, 7, 10, and Overture. As for the rest of them, that's up to you. I do regret buying some of them, but some of them are enjoyable. This series is pretty impossible to talk about or judge as a whole, but there are some real gems here, and you are missing out if you don't read them. Anyway, thank you for your time. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and may your reading find you well. May all your dreams be sweet tonight. Safe upon your bed of moonlight. And no, not of sadness. Pain.